Cleaning tools. Uh, so a little bit about me. Ah, oh, yes. I need to hit that the first time. Um, I'm a possessor of many hats. I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, currently at L3 Energy working on their cloud architecture. So if you're interested in uh, blockchain powered energy microgrids, that's what we do. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, formerly, I worked at Autodesk and as part of that team there, worked on a SOC 2 compliance uh, Docker service project, um, which is something we did achieve, uh, which was where I built, got a lot of this knowledge uh, and how I started on this whole Docker security thing. So it inspired this talk in many ways. So for, I will say, um, for that, that project, for SOC 2 compliance, we did use a commercial tool. Um, there are a few commercial tools out there and I've looked at a lot of them. They're very good. A lot of them are, they're also uh, very pricey. Um, <coughs> in my mind. So I started thinking, well, what can we do with Docker itself or with open source tools uh, for those situations which never happen in which you're told you need to secure your Docker environments and you get zero budget to do it with. Um, so that's kind of what inspired this talk. Um, and first, again, this is kind of just a little bit of recap. The whale in the room, I will address. Um, I, yes, not every container is a Docker container. So if you're using LXC, you're using RunC, you're using something else, that's fine. I acknowledge those things exist. Um, most of the stuff we're going to go over today, uh, well, in this, uh, yeah, uh, will be more specific to Docker. My background is with Docker itself. Um, so if you're using Docker, you should be able to get a great a lot out of it. If you're not using Docker, some of the stuff may not fully apply or may apply in different ways. Uh, so just pay attention to that. I'm also going to attempt to be orchestration platform agnostic. These, um, these particular tools that we're going to look at as part of this session um, don't really interact with the orchestration layer all that much, uh, but something to be aware of if you're using Kubernetes, you're using DCOS, you're using ECS, um, you, these tools may apply differently, or you may get some perspective on what the tool, the orchestration platform is doing for you. So first I just want to just set us, make sure we're on a solid foundation. I'm going to kind of recap some bits we did in part one and also kind of elaborate on some of it as well. Kind of make sure we're all working in the same understanding. Uh, so first of all, to note, security starts at the top. And what top means in this case is that line in the Docker file, the from line. So this Docker file sample has multiple security problems, but the main one, you know, not the least of them, the fact that it runs Node, but the main one um, that I want to highlight is that first line there. So why is this a problem? That one line can make a huge difference in your initial security posture for your container. <clears throat> so let's take a look at that particular one. This is Quay. Uh, adequate uh, security snapshot of the security scan of that container from Docker Hub. So if you did from Ubuntu uh, 1604, this is what you would get. 44 vulnerabilities, only one of which is high. Eh, that's not actually that bad, considering. Um, so we're actually going to look later in this talk at the scanner that powers this in Quay. So stay tuned. It's going to get great. But this is what you're inheriting. So if your application uses glibc or has a dependency on that, you're getting that vulnerability as part of your running application in your container. It gets worse. For Node fans, I love picking on Node because this is what it looks like. Uh, 83 high-level vulnerabilities. Um, again, if your application depends on these runtime libraries that are baked in this container and you just do from Node, you're getting this to start. So you're already starting in a pretty negative place. And if you're working if compliance is part of your picture, um, then, you know, and vulnerability management often comes into compliance auditing. Do you have known vulnerabilities you should deploy to somewhere? This is something you want to pay attention to. <clears throat> so what can we do to deal with this? 
So my recommendation, uh, something to take a look at, a way to mitigate a lot of this within the organization is creating a custom base container. So the idea is, rather than using something someone's put on Docker Hub, which who knows what they're looking at, looking at and kind of generalized for you know, the greater developer population and often chock full of vulnerabilities, um, create something that's specific to your environment, your runtime that has uh, a smaller set that you can share, that you can scan and assure is vulnerability free so you're starting in a known good place. So I'll take a look at some rules that I've come up with for uh, building these. So rule number one, starting tiny is better. So there's a ton of tiny Linuxes out there. Um, so Alpine is, is an example, the one I usually go to. I just heard about another one, Fusion, that I haven't used that I'm going to be looking into. Um, CoreOS has a tiny Linux. Um, they're really great because, for two reasons. One, they vastly reduce the number of things that are built in there, which shortens the number of bits you have to push over a wire. They also tend to have a smaller vulnerability uh, path or a smaller set of vulnerabilities because they put less stuff on there. So less is better in this case. So one note about Tiny Linuxes though, if you've never used them, something you know like BusyBox derived or something like that, is if you're only used to working with like Ubuntu or CentOS, they're a little quirky. They work a little bit differently. Some of the things you expect to be there or some of the commands you're used to may work a little bit differently on them. So take some time to experiment and explore these. It will pay off in a better result, both from size perspective and also from vulnerability perspective. Another thing is patch is part of your build. So whatever the runtime patch behavior is, run it. So if you're building an Ubuntu-based image, do apt update upgrade, right? You know, if you're doing CentOS, do yum update. So just always keep the latest and greatest of whatever's in your, you know, so if you do a monthly patching cycle or whatever you do, just do that as part of your custom base. This can create downstream problems in your build process, just to be aware of, because if you build, rebuild your base container, now you have a different base, and then you tell your development team, who are all using it, okay, there's a new base version out there, you could potentially be rebuilding um, at a higher level a lot of your containers. So this could have downstream impacts in your build process. It's worth it, though, to know you're starting from a good place. But just something to keep in mind, you may have to do some scheduling around this. So build a shared base for your services. So install all the common tools you use. So if you're, you know, Ruby, you know, install Gem, install Bundle, whatever in your service base, the things that you need in order to run it. Uh, if you're Node, you know, install your Node runtime, NPM, whatever you need to do to actually run it. So put everything in, so, so you have like a Node runtime base that you distribute out, that you've scanned, that you've cleared, you've hardened, you know it's good, uh, and share that out. And also install, you know, whatever your base runtime is. So if you're using Unicorn, you know, put that on there, distribute. So now you just need to drop your Ruby stuff in this location and it's good to go. Leave anything application specific for downstream. So even if, you know, if you've got a um, you know, NPM package that 60% you know, of your developer base uses, but 40% don't, let those people put that package in as part of their application build on your base. Don't bake it in there just because it's common-ish. Let applications deal with that. That'll, uh, that'll, that'll make the, the base container less subject to change and also reduce its uh, vectors. And install only the, the minimum of things you need, which is kind of general rule for security is don't put more than you want. Um, but that's where going with some of the bigger OS as your base can get you tripped up is because they include a lot of things that you'll probably never need or dependencies you don't need. Um, so only, you know, you can really tune these bases to exactly what you need for your environment and only that. And create build containers with your build tooling. Use that in your build process. Don't put your build tools in your base containers, your application runtime containers. So 
You'll end up with a couple of bases you need to manage. Tool containers are a little bit different. Um, you can kind of be a little bit more flexible because they're short-lived. You don't run everything out in production on your tool, your tool containers. Um, so it's okay if they've got vulnerabilities because you need glibc and it's a wreck on the distribution you're using, right? Um, because it's only going to live there. Don't distribute that with your runtime if you don't need it. Um, little pro tip here, uh, if you're experimenting with uh, one of these bases you've never used before, you want to get to know it, uh, <coughs> Docker Run IT gets you a shell in um, with that command, bin sh. Um, so Docker Run interactive tty, the image you want to do, and then command to the image, which in this case is just going to be shell. Then you can play around with it and you can kind of figure out what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> So you don't have to get frustrated with a Docker file that continues to fail. So there's another way to do containers um, that are not based on some higher level previous image, a, a big fat thing, and that is called a scratch container. So these are kind of a special version of a container that, um, that Docker allows you to build. So Docker containers do need a file system to execute. They can't just run without one. But it doesn't need to be like a big base OS type thing. It can be fairly small. It can be a single file if you want. And you can also build them directly. The way you do that is a special command from scratch, which is a special type that says, empty, get, create me an empty file system. I'm going to put whatever I want in this, and that's going to be my container, and that's it. So containers are not like virtual machines. They don't need the full thing. They share the kernel of the host they run on. So you can make them fairly small. You know, this kind of fits in with the only put in what you need. Where you would use this is with statically linked stuff, particularly. You know, so if your application is Go, there's no reason you need to install you know, Go on Alpine for unless you have some other weird thing that runs with it. You can just put the compile Go binary in there. You know, so your build tooling may have a full, uh, you know, uh, uh, an actual environment that you use, right? It may be based on Ubuntu or whatever. It's got Go, it's got everything it needs to do the build. But when it's got a build output, your Go file, um, just put that in your application container. Put in, and then along with the configuration files you need or what have you, and that's it. Two benefits. One, they're super small physically, so it's a lot less to push over a wire or store. Uh, two, the only vulnerability is going to be in your application. Um, so, and I will leave that to you. So some tips on how we can do it. It's kind of uh, one of the drawbacks, and we'll see later when we look at image scanning, um, if you're doing the scratch containers, is the image scanners kind of expect to find package managers and things. Um, so they may not notice anything. So just be aware, you might want to test how that works with any application you build if you're doing scratch containers. All right. So for the part one people, this is where we get into some new stuff. All right, you got your base container. You got your application container. Things are looking great, you th hope. How do you know that you actually did the job right? How, do we, how can we validate that we actually have a good container? So we're going to look at a few tools uh, that can help you make some progress in it, and we're going to attempt a demo of these, <laughs> a couple of these. So I like to live dangerously, so we'll see how this goes. I'm not on the conference Wi-Fi, so I'm hoping that gives me the edge. Um, but KDE worked the first time I plugged a video co cable into it, so maybe I've got the luck on my side today. All right, so let's take a look. at The first one that I want to talk about, InSpec. Who's ever heard of InSpec? A couple people. Sweet. InSpec. It's by Chef people. Probably ever, I would venture to guess everyone's heard of Chef. Most people haven't heard of this little project. InSpec is a compliance suite that's created by Chef, or it was adopted by Chef. Um, that allows you to do continue compliance against all kinds of stuff, including Docker containers. 
So we're gonna validate some hardening rules of a container that we built using InSpec. So it is a compliance suite. If you're familiar with RSpec, this is gonna feel very natural for you if you used RSpec. It also integrates with Test Kitchen, so you can use Test Kitchen to do validations of your container. So if you really love Test Kitchen, um, it's a plugin. It's like first class in there. Um, so I've used that before, and it's pretty good. It can validate just about anything. So Inspect is not limited to containers. It can do hosts. It can do physical systems. It can do cloud images. It can do anything it can connect to, um, similarly to Test Kitchen. So for Docker, we're gonna look at two things in particular. Um, it can validate the, your hardening work actually was done correctly on a container that you've built. And it can also verify the com, uh, container or the compliance of hosts. So, um, so you can use it for kind of like two different ways within your Docker environment. So I put this link in here because I think it's a great place, particularly if you're new to InSpec. There's a project out there called DevSec. It has a library of pre-built InSpec compliance profiles for you to use. So while they're kind of, again, Swiss Army knife style, cover a lot of things, um, you can kind of, it's all open source. You can fork it, you can download it, play around with it. It's a good place to learn about how and see how InSpec works and get some examples of how to do just about anything. Um, it's also, you can just try running the, some of the base benchmarks and see how far you get. So I'm actually gonna show that to you here, show you what DevSec looks like. Um, couple of the, we'll look at a couple of InSpec examples and then we're gonna actually run one. So here we go. Oh, I need to do this part first. Okay, so. DevSec. This is the path, github.com, dev sec. They've got a bunch of stuff in here uh, for chef stuff. They've got a Linux baseline. Um, they've got a uh, sys docker uh, center for... Internet security. Internet, yeah, <coughs> information security. Um, so they've got a, like, a Docker benchmark and a Kubernetes one for you Kube fans. Um, right out of the box, you can just download these, try them out. Um, they've got a ton of stuff in here. It's really kind of natural language stuff. So we'll take a look at what's in the Linux baseline so you can kind of see what these rules look like. Um, kind of starts with an inspect YAML file which defines you know the high level. So this is kind of like your gem file for Ruby people. Um, you know, this is you know contact information and what it is. So this is where you would start. That's the name that you refer to, or when you run an inspect profile, you know, it's gonna to refer to the name of the directory it's running in. Um, and then it's going to look for an inspect.yaml for the library. Um, you can define libraries which are kind of, um, you know, sets of information to feed in that can be consumed. So these are like maps of various things. Again, for Ruby people, you're like, oh, that looks awesome. For non-Ruby people, you're like, what is that? Um, so here's some uh, various like blacklisted uh, processes or, or SUID, you know, things to look for, no, it should not have a uh, set UID. Compliance profile, they, you put under the directory called controls. So t let's take a look at um, OS1. So you can get, put some boilerplate in there and stuff, but here's what a control looks like. You just define control, so this is similar to like describe, right? So this is the beginning of it and you give it an identifier. You can set that impact is how severe of a problem is this if this control fails. So you can kind of weight your compliance suites, um, title, and then you describe what it does. All right, so here's the description. It's gonna look to see host equiv file uh, has, um, should be disabled, right? So then here's your actual test. So again, our spec people, you know what this looks like. Describe this file, it should not exist. So it's gonna make sure there is no host equiv on this box. If it finds one, it fails the test. If it does not find one, it passes. And on and on through this list. So it's really great, and again, you can see, there's a lot of work they put into this. 
Um, great reference material and a great place to start if you're like, I want to get something running and we can figure out what right looks like later. Right. Um, so feel free to explore this project, DevSec. All right. We're going to reset this. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to uh, attempt to run this. Oh. So now I've spoiled the future. Oh, come on. Google has a problem with focus on Windows today. I'm using Google Slides for... All right, I'm going to fix that later. All right, here we go. So I've got an inspect rule here that I've written. This is in the uh, GitHub. There'll be a link at the end of this the talk. You can, you know, so if you want to play around with this, um, I've, so I've got my inspect.yaml file. I've got uh, my controls directory, and I've got two Docker files uh, because I have this super organized. Uh, containers we're going to test. Here's what we're going to test. <coughs> So, I built a couple of containers that are Flask apps, and I want to verify that my Flask app is not running as root. So that's my that's my compliance test. So again, inside your container, yes, it's an isolated namespace. Yes, UID on root zero does not in a container does not mean UID root on zero on the host, but still shouldn't do it. Don't let, your, don't let your containers become someone else's Bitcoin, Bitcoin miner. And I say that example because I've had that happen recently. Not my container. All right, so how do we do this? So let's, take a, let's actually take a look at those Docker files. So this is our Docker file. We're having a user. We've created a user sneak. Um, and you notice... Super simple to add users to run things as in Docker. Run, user add, whatever it is, things you need. Created a, a service account user, user sneak. So we're setting user context, anything that happens later in the Docker file will run as that user. And we're just calling Python and running our Flask app. The root one just doesn't have those two lines. Doesn't create a user, doesn't have a user line. So, run these as demons. Um, uh, what did I call this? Well, let me. I don't remember what I called these. So let me do Docker images. So here are my all my images. I've got a few, as you can tell. Docker run. I've got already, already got them running. All right. So that's how you would run them. I already had them running from a previous test of this. So saved a step. All right. So we're going to do docker exec uh, as root. So you can see my as root container has Python running app as root inside the container. And if I do user, you can see it's running as sneak. All right, so we have a compliance rule. We've got two containers, one good, one bad. Let's actually run inspec, Let's see how it works. Inspec. See, more people are watching it actually typed and that interferes with it. <laughs> Um, inspect uh, exec. I have these all written down, so I don't forget them. 
and then I can find them. So we're running the local suites. Minus T. So this is type docker colon whack whack as root. So I've named my container so I can refer to it as name. Docker will resolve that name for me because it's what it does. All right. Drum roll. Ooh. All right. You notice it failed. It's saying it should that our Flask app should not be running as root. It looked and it found user root and it did not it expected a value other than root. Woohoo. All right. Let's see what a good run looks like. All right, so now we're going to run against our good container. Woo, we won. All right, so that is uh, inspect in a very quick nutshell. There's a ton of stuff you can do with this. I will note also you do not have to have them local. Let's see if I can type this right the first time. Uh, dev sec. Can you Boom. Run, can you run this against non-containers as well? Yes. You can run inspect against anything it can connect to, similar to Test Kitchen. So this is also a great way to do, um, so you can write a compliant suite for your container. So you can say, okay, we want to get serious about security. So for any container we build, you have to, we have to provide an inspect suite that lets us make sure you've built this container right. Um, and so when, we, when Jenkins runs it, it spins it up. You know, as it does the build, passes tests. Okay, now I've got a running container. I go ahead and also run inspect against it, against whatever the compliance suite for that container is. You can verify that they didn't accidentally, you know, make a file were writable or whatever conditions. It can do a ton of stuff. All the inspect stuff is Ruby code, right? So it's all, you know, R spec derived. It's very powerful in things you can do. You can have full Ruby expressions in there. I showed a very simple example for two reasons. One. This is a conference talk, and two, my Ruby foo is not as well as it should be. Um, so there's a ton of things you can do with this. But you can also have a different compliance suite you run against your host and your production environment in a continual basis. Right. So right? That, was, that was looking at possibly running it against the host that's running the containers. Exactly. So you can say, you know, you know um, DevSec even had like a sys benchmark for Kubernetes nodes. So you can say, hey, we're on Kubernetes. Let's just see how bad according to this perspective of sys benchmarks, we are on our Kubernetes nodes, and then go from there. And that's something you can run continually against production or as part of your, uh, your deploy process for new nodes. So that's inspec. Um, really a lot of fun, a lot of good things you can do with that. So this is, uh, you know, in the in the notes, kind of a, a canon example. It's essentially what we did, just running against GitHub on that. Um, you can put URLs. You can check in. Now, one note, just be aware. You know, if you use private repositories, inspect will need to be able to get a key to fetch your your stuff if you're using GitHub. All right, let's talk about Claire. So I had promised this for now a talk and a half. And we were going to talk about the open source scanner that Quay uses. It's called Claire. Uh, Claire is a project that was written by CoreOS uh, for purpose of validation uh, of, of container vulnerabilities within their uh, registry. Um, so what it does is it pulls down uh, vulnerability data feeds from Ubuntu, Red Hat, from Oracle, in case anyone does anything with Oracle, uh, Alpine and um, NIST. Um, I don't remember what the National Institute for Standards and Technologies or something like that. So um, it's really designed to be integrated with registries or with like some kind of CI process. It's bare API. So it doesn't really have a lot of convenience. I'm going to show you an example. We're going to use a CLI tool called Claire Scanner that works with it. 
It's not very user friendly, I will warn you, just to use directly. Uh, but as part of integration with whatever your process is, once you kind of get over the initial learning curve of working with the API, API, you may be able to use this effectively within your environment to scan it. Um, now this is built into Quay, and so if you do have a little money to spend and you don't like your current registry solution, I would encourage you to do a trial of Quay and try it out, try out their vulnerability scanner. They do a better managed version of Claire as integrated in their process. Same code base, some different stuff on top of it that works with their, their registry environment. So That's my plug for Quay. They don't pay me to say that. Um, or at least I have not received a check yet. All right, so architecture is fairly simple. Claire uses Postgres as its data repository. This is where it stores a cached version of the vulnerability feeds, as well as any information it's tracking about layers. Um, Postgres is your only choice, so if you don't like Postgres, I'm sorry. Um, it does have a notification engine, so it can tell you, hey, I'm tracking this, this image, and we'll get to really a, a, an element about that in a minute. Um, and I've updated my vulnerability feeds, and now I realize that this image that I per previously thought was good now has a discovered vulnerability, and it can tell you about it. Again, a little bit weird to hook up, um, but it, it is the, the, there. So it goes out and pulls those CV data sources from a variety of feeds, um, and uh, you can work with it in your, your, K, your uh, data layer. Now, one note about Claire that if you're used to working with Docker at a higher level, maybe a little weird to get used to at first. Claire doesn't work with images, doesn't really know about them or at least not in its current stable release version. Claire no tracks layers. So a layer is what an image is composed of. And so just to make sure we're all clear on what that means, we're gonna actually gonna take a look at a simplified high-level anatomy of a Docker container to understand that. So when we build a Docker container, um, and we call it things like Ubuntu, or Node, or my app, um, we give it an image name. Docker, what it does is it goes through and builds for basically, it's essentially a one-to-one -one correspondence with the lines in your Docker file, a layer for each one of those lines. Each one of those commands. Commands, yeah. Not physical lines, each one of those commands. Um, those layers are really just tarballs, by the way. Just interesting thing about how Docker is structured, and then, it, uh, but each layer gets an identifier based on a hash code of what's in that layer. This is really great for a couple of reasons. One, I can take my container, I can push it into a registry system, and any layer that's exactly the same is only stored once, right? So it does some deduplication, makes it less require less storage. It also does that similar deep duplication for cache when you pull it. So if I do docker run or docker pull, I pull my container down. Any layer I already have, it doesn't have to pull that, it has it cached, so it makes launches really quicker. Um, so, but this is what Claire is working with. When it's talking about vulnerabilities, it's looking at vulnerabilities at the layer level, not at the image level. So you have to know that distinction if you're trying to get data out of it or you're looking at reports coming out of it. Um, is it doesn't really have that much of a concept of what an image is. It cares about layers. Uh, version, the newer version that they're working on, or it seems to be it's still in progress because I couldn't get it quite working right, it doesn't seem to be that stable, um, does know what an image is. They call it an ancestry and really works kind of at that level. So they're starting to get a little better, more user friendly at that. Um, but if you're working with the API, the current version, you want to integrate this with your registry system. You don't feed Claire an image, you feed Claire the layers of an image. So, and it's layer post, it's a post request on the layer API with the layer ID, and that's what Claire can then scan. Um, but there are some tool helper libraries, and the one we're going to use here in a minute, uh, Claire Scanner knows how to take something local. Uh, with an image name and then feed those layers to Claire for you so you don't have to think about it as much. 
All right, who's ready for a demo? We're gonna actually try out Claire. Here we go. So I have a Claire server set up. On EC2 machine. That I've named. Oh, see, so yeah, this is where. Oh, wait! Success! All right, the first hurdle's done. Maybe. Come on. Oh, wait. It's just super, super slow. It's even better. I'm paired to my phone. I was hoping that would absolve me any network issues. Come on, K. Oh, wait, no, I got a control C. Oh. All right, good times. All right, well, while that's trying to decide if it's going to do anything. Let's take a look at some other stuff. All right, so take a look at what we talked about later. We'll take a look at some images, and you can see what I mean by the layers. So our Docker images show you some things. These are the ones that we have. Let's take a look at the some of the inspect examples that we looked at earlier. Docker inspect inspect example. As user, uh, with a tag. All right, so you get a ton of information out of Docker Inspect on all of these. But what I want to focus in on really is these section here. So this particular container has a few different layers based on the run commands or the commands that we entered in the Docker file. Um, essentially, one-to-one -one correspondence for each command um, that it generated. So what this means is. If you just throw this out for free, um, as you're building your, your Docker containers, you want to try to avoid changing the higher level stuff as much as possible because that's going to cause everything below it to rebuild into a new thing. Um, so, you know, that's where that custom base can kind of get you tripped up because now you're really changing the thing at the very top and it's a full rebuild of the entire container derived from that base. So, um, as much as possible, it's better to change the, the higher level layers to pick it maximum advantage of the caching. But each layer is broken out, gets a unique hash code so that the entire, anywhere I run this container, it can correspond that layer with, um, you know, some other container that depends on it. So would that make it better to actually do the patching in the container at the last step? Well, it's a trade-off, right? So if you're going to do the patching in the container at your last step, um, are you talking about the base container or an application that's derived from that base? Application. So if you do it at the last step, you're going to patch every single application container you built. So that's going to be a whole lot more traffic, but you're going to potentially build less, right? You're going to rebuild less. Um, so it's like you kind of pay a one-time penalty and that's where we're getting kind of on a scheduled patch where it's like, hey, we know we're going to have longer builds on this time of the month, right? Might just something kind of makes that bearable. All 
Right. So there's another command, docker history. Here you can see all the commands that built this layer, um, including things that inherited from other places, right? So here's some of the base stuff from the Ubuntu container that I built, that was built on. Um, and then here's all the commands we run. All right, did we actually get... No, my... Um... So my clear example is not happy with me, unfortunately. Um... I'm not confident is a Wi-Fi problem. <laughs> so let's um, tell you what. Let's try this. Um, I've got what does CloudWatch say about it? Because everything else seems running okay. All right. Well, I will change the setting in AWS, and we'll see if this catches up. Hey, we might actually be in business here. All right. Find my mouse cursor on the screen. Oh, now you're not going to work. So when you're filling out conference evaluations, just forget this part of it. <laughs> <laughs> just say we admire his bravery for attempting a demo. Blame the network. I can always blame the network. way longer than it should have. Okay, let's take a quick look at Cryer. All right, so just to show you, it is an, an API driven here. Local host. V1. Spaces. So here are all the things that Claire knows how to deal with. You got a few different versions of Alpine, a couple different versions of Debian, some Oracle. Good stuff. All right, so we're going to use Claire Scanner. We're going to scan a CentOS 7 image. Claire Scanner is a CLI tool um, that's provided third party from Claire, uh, but it seems to work pretty well for this kind of a thing, at least for example. And we're going to go ahead and turn all. So one of the cool things about Claire is you can tell it, I don't care about certain vulnerabilities, right? If you know that pack, uh, it, like a false positive exists, you can give it white lists and things. Um, but for the purposes of our demo, we're going to do all of them. We want the worst of the worst. We'll do CentO 7. Here we go. Think about it. What? I've already pulled it. I've already done these, so I know the outcome. All right. So let's, um, oh, let me do this. But you can see here some of the things that it does, right? So it's giving you a nice, this particular format picture. 
It's telling you that the vulnerability is one you have not whitelisted. It is showing um, the, the CVI identifier for that vulnerability, as well as the package it was detected in the package version and some information about what it is and the fix. So it scrapes all this stuff. So it's great in that it gives you a full report of everything it found and some information about how to fix it. Um, one way you might be able to use this in conjunction with some system that you have in place, and this is a Claire scanner thing, if I just give it an R and test.json, it's gonna still show me everything on the screen, uh, but it's also gonna give me JSON output that we can look at a little bit better. Um, but it gives me a full sense of the vulnerabilities that it was able to find. And you can see here, maybe. Uh, that's an awful lot of red. Um, if you can read it. It looks good. Oh, uh, wrong, because it's... There we go. That's right. It's all vulnerabilities, so it's supposed to look red, right? It's supposed to look evil. Um, so you see, okay, it found these unapproved vulnerabilities, and here's all the details on it. So it looks like there's uh, seven or so in this. Um, so it's a cool way you can know what you, if you've put anything in your image, that may be bad. Now, we'll say it's about Claire. Um, I've used, I've tested this and evaluated it. I've also used some commercial scanning tools. Uh, Claire is kind of in the better than nothing category. Um, I'm more worried about false negatives than false positives with Claire, um, but it certainly is something that if you do have a zero dollar budget um, or a effort only budget, uh, it could potentially you know find something that you've missed. All right. So, yeah. Uh, so any comparison on using rolling your own Claire versus running it on Quay versus using something like. Um, I can give you my opinion on it. Uh, if you can get away with budget to have someone else do this for you, I would. Uh, Quay is uh, a nice uh, place to start because it's actually a pretty good registry system as well. It has good role-based access and fine-grain controls um, in addition to being a, um, having an integrated vulnerability scanner. X-Ray I haven't used personally. I've you know, kind of read about it and stuff. If you have Artifactory and you're using it as your registry, go with it, set it up, see how, how well it does. Um, so, and you know, some of the more you know, dedicated security tools in this space have you know, their own scanner things, but they basically do the same thing as Claire's. In fact, the dirty little secret is a lot of them use either using Claire and have built things around using Claire as part of their product or um, used to and I've now the expertise to move beyond it right so um, but you know kind of get what you pay for on, on those so I've used the scanners in both Twistlock and Aquasec um, they're both excellent scanners I think Aquasec has a better scanner than Twistlock does but runtime the agent price for those are all fifteen hundred dollars per node. So if you're running a significant environment, that's real money. Um, this you know it's purely open source, and you know in the spirit of open source, if you think you can make it better, you know make it better. It does have some pluggable infrastructure, um, so if you've got your own things, drivers you want to implement and stuff, and you, you totally can. All right, um, we'll wrap up with one last item here. I want to mention Docker Bench. Docker Bench is a uh, host evaluation tool uh, to, that runs a, their version of a sysbenchmark against a Docker host system. Um, it's really, uh, it's created and maintained by, by Docker. I'm saying it's usually a CIS inspired rule set, mostly because I haven't dig, dug through it to make sure they see if they've got all of them. But you can also put your own custom rules in there. So if you've got special compliance environment, things you need to do, you can add or remove controls. Um, it's provided by 
you know, free, kind of out of the box ish. You know, it's one you can pick, take and pull and do your own thing. Um, I don't really have a demo for this. Um, it's part time related and uh, part. Um, I think if I were doing this in my environment, I'd probably go with InSpec. Uh, it's got a little more power and I can do it for more than just Docker hosts. Um, so, but this, I just want to let you know, this is out there, it's available, it's free, you can, you can try it out and you may really like it. But it's pretty much the same between Inspect and Docker Bench. I mean, you, you wouldn't run both. No. I would pick one, and if I'm going to invest time, I'd probably invest in Inspect that covers more cases okay. and kind of easier to tailor to my environment than Docker Benches. Okay. So wrap up a little bit, uh, talk about kind of vulnerability lifecycle, and really what I want to do is kind of show you a hypothetical CI build process that uses some vulnerability management tools in order to you know, guarantee a, an initial start of secured containers. So up in the corner, this is again, simplified version of it. Uh, we got Jenkins building a Docker and testing our container. That's the same you're doing today, right? And I'm just going out on a limb that you use Jenkins. Um, as part of that, it works with a uh, Claire environment, uh, in this case, um, that's within the build environment to scan the container. This is going to, it's going to send the layer, say, hey, and which could be local, right? Um, so not in a register yet. Give us the results. It's going to go through that result, say, do we, do we meet a vulnerability threshold? No highs, whatever your threshold for that product is. If it comes back and says, yes, this is bad, or yes, it has high vulnerabilities, or whatever, fail to build, you now have another step in your process. You can integrate inspect in this process the same way. Well, I did put it in the diagram, but uh, you could do that as well. You could do a vulnerability scan if that passes, do inspect if that passes, containers hardened to the standard. Only then push to a registry. Now, in your registry, you could have uh, some kind of an event hook, and what that looks like could depend on your registry technology. So I've left that purposely vague. Um, that then integrates with kind of a more monitoring environment of Claire, something that's tracking all of the images we put on our registry, and that we've set up with a notifier. So that if it detects a vulnerability in, a reg in an image that's already hit our registry, we can then kick that out to somebody and say, hey, there's a vulnerability now. Someone needs to deal with this. And then feed that back in through your build process as a resolution. So that's it. Um, and there's a link to the GitHub. You can kind of see some of these things. There's a whole lot of things in this space. I gave you a couple of the more uh, interesting tools that I've played around with uh, that you can, uh, you know, integrate in your own process. Any questions? All right. Thank you.